Hi, a oh, very good evening, all of you. Welcome to our 13th session, Case-Based Discussions Made Easy. I hope you guys are all ready. So without much delay, let's go ahead with our discussion. Yeah, let me know if you have any issues with streaming quality, including the audio and video streaming. So before we go ahead, as you know, the objectives, if the learning is not fun, then what's the point in doing it? Learning is fun. Learning will be fun if we're doing it in a right way. And also, whenever you're attending any of the live sessions or discussions, make sure that you have your own customized notes as it is going to save you time and enhance your confidence in the process, especially during your revision phase. So keeping these objectives in mind, let's go ahead with that discussion. We'll start with a quote and then we'll move ahead. Go ahead with context and related multiple choice questions. Also, we have posted we have been posting homework questions at the end of every session, and I'm glad to see so many of you actually participating in sending your work through mail. So those who are not doing it, I encourage you to do it without taking it for granted, right? Because searching for answers via standard references promotes actual learning, promotes engagement, and it makes the learning process even more fun. Mark my words. Hi, Rishikesh, Kishan, Kishor, Sidra, Shubangi, Hi, Shahadiya, Madhuri, Shailaza, Ritu, Payal, Shmriti, Meliza. Hi, a very good evening, all of you. So before we start, as you know, we have the following courses going on towards NEET MDS 2022 and 2020, 2023, respectively. So you can check our website, ptbdacademy.com for all the details. And before we start, so we'll initiate a discussion with the following quote, success, who is defining it? See, uh, first of all, we often look for definitions. It can be academic related or even non-academic related so that we can find some meaning in those words. So what's the definition of success? In fact, this is one of the quotes which I've come across during my uh, you know, very early stage of my undergraduation. So instead of waiting for others' definition of success, why don't you define it? Why don't you define the same, the very word success? So actually, the major issue or one of the major issues which the younger generation or the millennial, the so-called millennials are facing now is trying to chase this so-called success. In, in preparation context, success means obviously good marks and good ranks or in life in general, acquiring or accumulating more wealth or fame is obviously considered as success, obviously. But have you ever questioned yourself, like what do they actually mean to you? I mean, let's take preparation for instance. You got very good score. You secured the best rank possible. Does it actually mean anything to you? Or let's suppose you're successful in your life, if you have been accumulating so much of money and fame, what does it actually mean for you? The reason why I'm asking you these questions is, most of us in this blind trap of following the definition of the societal accepted term success, we are actually becoming more and more shallow in the process. Of course, we can earn more money, we can have more fame, can get best marks, best ranks, but are they giving us that sense of happiness? Are they giving us that sense of fulfillment? Are they giving us a sense of satisfaction? Because uh, if you get good marks in this exam, most of us are under a kind of stress to perform even in the next exam. If we're earning some X amount this day or this month, obviously it is leading to some kind of pressure as to whether we can earn the same amount or more amount the next month or the next year or the next year. So uh, my point is, please keep all these definitions of success aside and ask yourself, like, do they actually mean something to you? Because mostly they're very shallow and they do not offer any hope 
for us in the process of this our life. So if you find something which actually gives you some sense of purpose or you find meaning in doing certain things, then that is something which I would definitely encourage you to follow. It can be anything for that matter. If you love teaching, if you love practicing, if you love treating, or it can be anything for that matter. Because once you find meaning or purpose in your life, then rest of the things will follow. Money follows, fame follows, marks follow, ranks follow. So my point is, do not follow the definitions given by others, including myself. Don't follow our definitions of success. Define it for yourself. Find the purpose of your life. It might take time. When I say find purpose or uh, what's your passion, find it. It doesn't mean that it happens overnight. Some things take time. Nurturing relations take time. Nurturing relationships take time. Uh, obviously, uh, finding the purpose of your life, uh, life definitely takes time. You should be patient enough and you should keep looking, keep searching. And once you realize the fact that your life purpose lies in doing certain things, and that is something which you should follow, no matter what the situations or circumstances are. That will eventually lead to success. And in fact, you'll start experiencing success in the process of that journey. So a name, fame, money, marks, ranks, if you carefully observe, these are all superficial or hollow, I would say. Just ask yourself, like, what is the purpose of my life? And what am I going to do with my life in order to enhance my very own life along with the lives of others around me? These questions might be difficult to answer. We'll definitely not find ready-made answers, but they're at least worth asking others, right? So don't let others define anything for you. You have your own life and you have the very own potential to define your own success. So with these introductory comments, Let's go ahead with our context today. Hi, Tanmay. Hi, Monica. Very good evening. So here is the context we have. A two-year-old boy has bone deformities such as bolex. I'm sure you'll give the diagnosis upon going through this first phrase itself. But anyways, let me complete this for sake of completing it. A two-year-old boy has bone deformities such as bolex, knock knees, and pigeon chest. He has a history of delayed eruption of teeth. On inquiry, the mother of the child or the boy informs the physician that they have been living in Canada for the past five years. Laboratory findings include the following. 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels less than 30 nanograms per ml. Calcium levels 7 milligrams per deciliter. Phosphate levels, serum phosphate levels, 2.6 milligrams per deciliter. Alkaline phosphate levels, around 250 units per liter. And also you can find the normal ranges of normal values uh, in normal form, right? They're not in bold. So if you carefully observe this context-based or case-based question, as I keep on reminding, case-based question is a kind of question with several hints or clues where you should be able to identify the same. And if you have some background information, you can answer them with ease, with speed and accuracy. So the areas highlighted in red are the keywords or hints which will help you answer this particular question. So age of the boy, age of the child, chief complaint or the clinical presentation, bone deformities like bolex, knock knees, pigeon chest. And also oral manifestations such as delayed eruption of teeth. So by two years, you can expect the eruption of primary centrals, laterals, can and even first molars for that matter, primary molars. And on inquiring, mother informs the physician that they have been living in Canada for the past five years, which means even before delivery, mother has been in, uh, staying in Canada, family has been staying in Canada. Why Canada in specific? Is it because my aunt is living in Canada, or is it because I love Canada? But the point is, there are two reasons why I chose Canada for this particular context. One, it is uh, above 55 plus latitudes, like it is uh, in an area where the sunlight is not so abundant. And secondly, most of the Indians, like especially the Punjabis, the North, and also many Indians, because of favorable immigration policies, are uh, nowadays 
emigrating, I mean, emigrating to Canada, right? So those are the two reasons why I chose this country. And laboratory findings include the following. You can see a uh, 25, uh, uh, two five dihydroxy, uh, two five hydroxy vitamin D levels. More than fifty nanograms per uh, ml are considered to be acceptable. Less than thirty nanograms in this particular context. Calcium levels are also low, even though uh, compared to adults, the calcium levels in children have to be comparatively higher. But here it is low. Phosphate levels also seem to be low, but alkaline phosphatase levels (ALB) seem to be touching the roof, higher. So this is the context we have. So most of you have already given your diagnosis, which is very impressive. Now let's see how many of you are going to score 20 upon 20 in this particular session. Since you put the diagnosis even uh, without facing any questions, so that's a challenge I'm going to throw at you. How many of you are going to score 20 upon 20 in this session? So before that, observe this chest X-ray. So you can clearly see that there is generalized radiolucency. Along with that, the arrows, which you can see at the bottom, you can see the enlarged areas of the anterior chondral attachments. So you can just look into the expansion of anterior rib ends, which are denoted by these white arrows, right? The ratchetic rosary, if you remember. This enlargement is because of accumulation of hypertrophied cartilaginous cells or chondrocytes. We'll discuss the mechanism a bit later. And observe these proximal areas of humerus. You can see uh, the cortical tunneling, the so-called splaying, and also you can see radiolucency here, radiolucent lines in these areas. So observe this chest X-ray carefully, and I'll give you the following information. So in the bottom, you can see these arrows, not the arrowheads. I'm talking about these arrows. You can find expansion of anterior rib ends. So these are the areas we're talking about. And also these arrowheads, as you can see, there is marked reduction in bone density, cortical tunneling, fraying or splaying. Fraying is nothing but wearing out. Appearing, I mean, not clearly demarcated because of poor mineralization. And also there is splaying or splitting up. It can be pathological in nature, especially in the proximal humeral growth plate. So you have these epiphyseal growth plates, right? So we'll get back to the details of this a bit later, the pathophysiology and all. And also you can find the oral cavity, at least the teeth. Anyways, let's exclude that part. So this is the preliminary information you have related to this particular case or context. Now, here is the first question. So what is the most probable diagnosis? Congenital syphilis, osteogenesis imperfecta, rickets, none of the other. As you know, osteogenesis imperfecta, genetic predisposition because of involvement of collagen type 1 alpha 1 or collagen type 1 alpha 2 genes also there can be there is a clear cut classical manifestation of eyeballs blue sclera and also there can be short stature scoliosis hearing loss underdeveloped lungs leading to respiratory uh, difficulties etc and uh, so you can rule out osteogenesis is imperfect Congenital syphilis, you know, the classical dental manifestations, Hutchinson's triad, also saddle nose, deafness, clouding of cornea, blindness, etc. So you can rule out these two options. Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll rule out the option none, which, which is supposed to be D. What about rickets? So as majority of you have rightly chosen, already while I was explaining the context, plus four, award yourself plus four option C, rickets is the right answer. So why rickets? Because of the following key features. Rickets is usually seen between the age group, in the children, between the age group six months to two years. So it's matching with that. And also there are some characteristic, classic clinical presentation in the form of craniotabs, ratchetic rosary, bow legs, knock knees, pigeon chest, anterior thrusting of the sternum, right? And also delayed eruption of teeth, enamel hypoplasia, dentin developmental uh, disturbances, and large pulp chambers, right? And, you know, on inquiry, mother is saying that they have been staying in Canada for the past five years. So what is the significance of this, even before delivery? See, if mother is vitamin D deficient, the mother is hypocalcemic, she has a greater tendency to carry out uh, those features to the infant as well, right? 
So that's the significance of that point. And you can clearly see that lab findings reveal that vitamin D, right? 25 hydroxy vitamin D is less. Calcium levels are either normal or slightly decreased. Uh, it can be normal if there is compensation through rise in PTH, right? So that's secondary. Phosphate levels also are dropping, but alkaline phosphatase levels are rising because the body is trying to enhance, you know, as a compensatory mechanism, the body is trying to enhance osteoblastic activity, even though that's not possible because of this vitamin D deficiency. So alkaline phosphorus levels also rise. So based on this, I'm sure you're given the diagnosis after observing this chest radiograph, you're given the diagnosis of rickets. Yeah. Now let's move on to the next question. Let's see how many of you are going to answer it right. True about rickets. It develops before epiphyseal plate fusion. It's associated with defective mineralization of bone matrix. Develops after epiphyseal plate fusion. Main cause is vitamin C deficiency. So which one do you think is a more appropriate answer? So first of all, as you know, rickets is a disease which is seen in children which is characterized by defect in mineralization as well as a widening of epiphyseal plates. So there are uh, two versions of vitamin D deficiency, like it can either lead to rickets or it can even lead to osteomalacia. Uh, I'm sure you know the distinction between the same. So I'll let you know after uh, you answer this question. And vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus are the levels or uh, the main factors as you know, that will influence the bone mineralization as well as maturation. So what's the main distinction between rickets and osteomalacia? Rickets is something which is seen in case of children, osteomalacia in case of adults. And for your information, rickets and osteomalacia can be seen in children, right? Yes. However, as majority of you are rightly are, I think you're choosing either option A as well as option B. Okay, let me give out this information for you. Rickets is characterized by defect in mineralization and widening of epiphyseal plates. Osteomalacia, however, is a defect in mineralization of bone matrix. Both rickets and osteomalacia usually occur together in children. Rickets occurs exclusively in children, whereas adults develop osteomalacia after epiphyseal plate fusion. So we have this uh, criteria like before epiphyseal plate fusion, we uh, term it as uh, the developmental uh, defect that's happening is rickets, but after the epiphyseal plate uh, fusion, the kind of defect which we are seeing is termed as osteomalacia. So are you sure it is both A and B? So I want you to review your answers once again. And in the meantime, let, it, let me give you some additional information. See, vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus are the main factors that influence bone maturation and mineralization. Defective mineralization can lead to both rickets as well as osteomalacia. Rickets is characterized by defect in mineralization and widening of epiphyseal plates, as you have rightly mentioned. Whereas osteomalacia, however, is defect of just mineralization process as such. Whistler, Borg, Gleason, and their colleagues, fellows of Royal College of Physicians London in the 17th century were the first to describe rickets in medical literature. Nutritional rickets is the most common cause of bone disease all over the world, especially in developing countries. And uh, needless to say, uh, in countries like third world countries, because of nutritional deficiency, yeah, there can be rickets. So which one do you think is more appropriate option? Rickets, is it associated with defective mineralization of bone matrix? Option A is right answer, develops before epiphyseal plate fusion. Option C develops after epiphyseal plate fusion. That is true in case of osteomalacia. And so that way you can rule out option C. What about option D? Main cause is vitamin D deficiency. What about option B? I think, yeah, majority of you are choosing even option B, but defective mineralization of bone matrix 
is one of the features of Austria Malaysia, but not rickets. Rickets is characterized by defect in mineralization and widening of epiphyseal plates, especially the proximal ends of these long bones, right? So given the literature and information we have, option A would be more appropriate answer. B, C holds true in case of Austria Malaysia, and option D is irrelevant. So if you had chosen option A, give, uh, do award yourself plus four. So is it clear or uh, do you want any further clarification? Yeah, right, I hope it's clear. And if you need any further clarification, do let me know. In the meantime, let's move ahead with, uh, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead with the next question. All of the following are clinical manifestations of ricket except. So I'm sure you know the classical presentation of rickets. We have been discussing the same. Uh, bow legs, bow shaped legs, because if the person is mobile, because of the softening, lack of mineralization, there can be bending or bowing of the legs. So that's called as bow leg deformity. Knock knees, the knees knock against each other and the ankles are apart, right? Because of overgrowth of epiphyseal regions of long bones like uh, femur, tibia, fibula, etc. And along with that, we can uh, even find softening of skull bone. In fact, this is considered one of the earliest manifestations in case of rickets, uh, seen after age of three months of age. And what about Harrison's screw? It's a depression at the lower side of the rib cage that occurs as diaphragm pulls the soft rib cage at its insertion site. We we'll look into the illustration. And option C, lower limb deformities include genu varus and genu valgus. So what are these terms? All of the above, none of the above. So as majority of you have rightly chosen, yes. All of the following are clinical uh, manifestations and there are no exceptions. So gen varus and genovalgus are nothing but bow legs and knock knees. So cranial tears, Harrison's grew lower limb deformities like knock knees, bow legs, ratchetic rosary, right? So all of these are clinical manifestations of rickets award yourself plus four and do have a look at this particular illustration. So you can see cranial tapes softening, right? In the flat bones, uh, because of which the skull appears square and almost uh, square shaped skull. Pigeon chest deformity, ratchetic rosary, Harrison sulcus depression because of uh, the pull of diaphragm and also because of the softened ribs, lumbar low doses, enlarged epiphyses of radius, right? The epiphyseal plates are enlarged, knock knees. The knees are in fact uh, knocked. It doesn't represent the knock knees, this illustration, but knock knees will be something like that. If you assume that these are your knees, so ankles will be apart, right? Something like this, something like this. Yeah, bow legs. So these are some of the uh, clinical uh, manifestations of rickets. And you can also clearly find a, a real life illustration onto your right. So just keep this illustration in mind. And ratchetic rosary, as you can see, uh, costochondral junction, the epiphyseal plates are enlarged, right? So in fact, there is a very simple mechanism explaining why there is enlargement of these epiphyseal plates, the cartilaginous regions. Because of vitamin D deficiency, the calcium levels also will be dropping as a compensatory mechanism, parathyroid hormone levels rise. And as a consequence, there will be increased excretion of phosphate and uh, hypophosphatemia. Because of this, there is inhibition of apoptosis of chondrocytes, leading to accumulation of chondrocytes, cartilaginous uh, uh, cells. And there is hypertrophy of chondrocytes in accumulation leading to this enlarged epiphyseal regions, costochondral junctions, as you can clearly see in this particular illustration, right? So keep this illustration in mind, and I'm sure you can definitely remember as many clinical features or clinical manifestations as possible. Because of weakened chest, there will be anterior thrust of the sternum giving this pigeon chest deformity. Also, there can, because of weakening of bones, there can be pathological fractures, which is quite obvious, isn't it? 
And the beauty of this uh, pathology, even though I shouldn't use this word beauty, but uh, if it is nutritional deficiency upon administration of vitamin D, see, most of these features can be in fact reversed. If sometimes, if they persist, then we can go with orthodontic corrections, but usually they can be reversed. Bow legs, for instance, can be reversed in two years. It takes at least two years uh, to get back to a normalcy, right? Other biochemical levels can be restored within a matter of a week or two weeks, right? So that is something which is already there in your reference material. You need not worry about it. So what about the oral manifestations of rickets, which is very important in a dental perspective? Delayed dentition is something which you have already seen in the context. What about enamel hypoplasia, large pulp chambers, or is it all of the above? So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Oral manifestations of rickets. So uh, because of this defective mineralization, because of altered levels of calcium and phosphorus in body, it is taking a toll even on dentition. For unexplained reasons, the dentition timetable is also being altered as we have already seen in this particular context. So we can expect delayed dentition. What about enamel hypoplasia? In fact, in osteogenesis imperfecta, we talk about dentinogenesis imperfecta. But what about enamel hypoplasia, large pulp chambers? So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So I think it's quite obvious. All of the above, as majority of your choosing is right answer. Also, there is dentin defect formation, like a dentin which is formed is not qualitative. And also this further uh, enhances or accentuates the pulp forms. And also there can be large pulp chambers. And I don't know whether I put this in the form of homework question, but because of these changes within the dentition, there is a greater chance for the microbial factors to enter into the tooth, leading to recurrent abscesses. Uh, anyways, if it is in homework question, I want you to find out about the same and see if you can get additional inputs. And final question, let's see. So all four questions, more or less, you've answered them right. So what about the final question? Let's see how many of you are going to get it right. Important lab or laboratory marker to diagnose rickets. Serum 2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D, serum calcium, serum alkaline phosphatase, serum phosphate. So which of the following? In fact, in lab investigations, you have seen the levels of all of these, right? Enzymes or vitamins. So which one do you think is the most important laboratory marker to diagnose rickets? Definitely one of the challenging questions. Let's see how many of you are going to get it right. See, you should understand that rickets, there are three types. Calcipinic, phosphopinic, or the third one is because of a defect in mineralization. Uh, it can be genetic related. So there are basically three types of rickets. In case of Phosphopenic rickets, the levels of serum calcium are more or less normal. In case of calcipenic rickets, the levels of phosphates are initially normal, but because of PTH, their levels will eventually fall. And only in case of vitamin D uh, dependent rickets, that is nutritional deficiency related rickets, the serum levels of 25-dihydroxy vitamin levels are low. So my point is, A, B, and D can remain normal, as I mentioned just now. If the rickets is not related to nutritional deficiency, like vitamin D-resistant rickets or familial rickets, then serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels will remain normal. If it is calcipenic rickets, then phosphate levels can remain normal. If it is calcipenic or phosphopenic, right? Uh, so one or the other, serum calcium, serum phosphate, or option A levels can remain normal. However, the alkaline phosphatase levels increase no matter what kind of uh, rickets it is. It can be calcipenic rickets, it can be phosphopenic rickets, or it can be rickets due to defect in mineralization because of genetic related causes. Alkaline phosphatase levels always rise because of body's compensatory mechanism or body's attempt to increase osteoblastic activity, right? So I hope you got the answer. And I think 
Majority of you haven't chosen it. Option C is a right answer. So in order to explain the same, let me review some additional information for your benefit, which is related to this uh, serum alkaline phosphatase. Also, we'll look into other enzymes and their relevance as well. So the most important laboratory marker to diagnose rickets is serum alkaline phosphatase, which is typically high as this is a disease of abnormal mineralization and increased osteoblastic activity. So abnormal mineralization, increased osteoblastic activity is happening eventually, thereby elevating serum alkaline phosphatase levels. Alkaline phosphatase activity is induced by phosphate deficiency in rickets. In phosphopenic rickets, ALP values are frequently noted between 400 to 800 international units per liter. If you remember, the normal range is around 130 international units per liter. And in calcipenic rickets, ALP is markedly elevated, and the values are frequently noted up to greater than 2,000 international units per liter. It is also an excellent marker to observe or monitor disease activity. So if you have another question like, which of the following enzymes are essential or are very important markers to monitor disease activity, it has to be alkaline phosphatase. What about serum 25-dihydroxy vitamin D? So this is another laboratory marker that helps to diagnose rickets, especially the nutritional deficiency of vitamin D. If it is not nutritional deficiency or nutritional related, then the levels obviously can be normal. What about serum calcium and phosphate levels? So depending upon the type of rickets, that is calcipenic or phosphopenic, the levels can remain normal. Serum calcium levels are usually normal in case of phosphopenic type, whereas in case of calcipenic rickets, the serum phosphate levels are initially normal. So I hope you got my point as to why I mentioned those options initially so that you'd exclude them from the right answer. So I hope it's clear. So as some of you have rightly chosen, yeah, ALP is actually non-specific. We cannot say this is specific to this. See, along with clinical features, along with radiographic features, along with biochemical features, so we should make a diagnosis because as one of you, Sidra rightly mentioned, ALP, uh, non-specific. We cannot say it specifically rises only in case of rickets. There are many pathologies which we reviewed in the initial uh, sessions itself, like where ALP actually arises. So option C is right answer. And before we conclude this session, we have the following homework questions. What is STOS therapy, STOSs, STOS therapy? And number two, what is the relation between solar genic angle and vitamin D production? So what is the solar genic angle? It's an interesting concept, just go through it. And you'll also understand why I placed Canada keyword in the questions. And third, what is the reason for recurrent dental abscesses in vitamin D resistant rickets? So I wanted to just check out this question as well, even though I've given you some inputs regarding the same. So three questions, try finding out and get back through mail for keep, as well as for our analysis. I hope it's clear. And, you know, interestingly, vitamin D, uh, we're talking about rickets, we're talking about pathologies associated with lack of vitamin D in general. Interestingly, vitamin D can be produced endogenously within the skin. You know, 7 calciferol. Uh, you have this 7-hydroxy, uh, uh, we have this cholesterols, and upon uh, incident of ultraviolet B rays in the wavelength of around 290 to 320, there will be formation of vitamin D2 and D3. So endogenous production of uh, vitamin D happens. And in fact, 90% of vitamin D, as far as I remember, can be produced through endogenous route. Uh, exogenous routes include the foodstuffs, right? Uh, fish liver oils, uh, we're talking about uh, various, and also certain plants, certain seeds, as mentioned in Harsh Mohan. So you can go through it as well. So endogenous uh, synthesis, around 80%, not 90%, but around 80% of body's need of vitamin D is met by endogenous synthesis from the action of ultraviolet B rays on 7D hydrocholesterol, right? And this leads to formation of vitamin D3. Uh, and we have this uh, calci, ergocalciferol, calcitriol. Calcitriol is considered to be functionally active. 
right? So we have this normal uh, physiological process that is happening within the body and vitamin D helps in enhancing the intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus. It also helps in reabsorbing calcium from the kidneys and distal uh, convoluted areas. And another important function of vitamin D on bones is it's normally required for mineralization of epiphyseal cartilage as well as osteoid matrix. So once vitamin D levels drop, so the reverse happens, right? Calcium levels drop, phosphate, phosphorus levels drop, the mineralization of the bone is affected. And as a consequence, depending upon the age of the patient, we are looking at this uh, wide range of clinical manifestations, including oral manifestations, right? And also in Harsh Mohan, you can actually find a beautiful table uh, giving you the difference between normal bone growth and rickets. So that will give you a tremendous idea as to where or which areas are actually being affected in case of rickets, right? Mineralization is being affected, the epiphyseal growth plate, right? Uh, so there is enlargement of the epiphyseal ends because of one of the mechanisms, as I mentioned previously. So calcium drop, PTH uh, levels rise, ultimately phosphorus levels drop, and this leads to inhibition of apoptosis of chondrocytes leading to their hypertrophy and accumulation, leading to enlargement of epiphyseal growth plates, right? The end, end, end parts of these long bones. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. Once you have an idea on the normal physiology, like what's happening in normal case scenarios, then you can make out and differentiate the abnormalities, right? So of all these, consider the clinical manifestations of rickets very, very important, including the terms such as craniotapes, ratchetic rosary, Harrison sulcus, bow legs, knock knees, etc. I think we have already presented them in the form of an illustration. And if you have any queries, you need any further assistance. As you know, you can always get back through mail 24 by 7. So I hope, I hope it's clear. I wish you all the best. Love you all. Yeah, by the way, how many of you scored 20 upon 20? Pile has scored 15, excellent. Yeah, there has to be UV light exposure in specific UVB, which has a wavelength range of 290 to 320 nanometers. Yes, and my in our exams for case based patients will they provide normal values also, like you have mentioned here. Uh, I don't think so. So that's the reason why uh, what I usually say is like, there are certain values which you should remember, like serum calcium levels, phosphorus levels. Alkaline phosphatase, okay, that's fine, but at least various essential minerals, you have to memorize these uh, values. And also we, are present, we have presented them in our e-classes. Also, you can go through them in any standard uh, literature, standard textbooks like physiology textbooks, right? Guyton, or you can even go through biochemistry textbooks, such an arena. We can go through various uh, normal ranges. Even though if you can't accurately remember the normal range, at least you should have a rough idea. Like when I say serum calcium levels, 9, 10, 11, it will be rotating in and around those values, right? In case of children, it can be slightly be higher, but it is usually in the range of nine to 11. Even if you can't remember them accurately, at least you should have some vague idea. See, because you're not going to deal with just calcium levels. You should know levels of phosphorus in this particular instance. Hydroxy, uh, vitamin D, 225 hydroxy vitamin, 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin levels, right? So at least you should have some vague idea and consider that very, very important. If they give you the normal ranges, that's well and good. What if they don't give? They assume that they're not going to give you the same and try preparing accordingly. <laughs> I can't say whether it depends on one's mood, but if I were an examiner, I wouldn't give the normal ranges. No. Uh, see, uh, it doesn't mean that I, I, I want to test the levels of uh, chloride, uh, test the knowledge, like uh, whether you know the value of chloride levels or magnesium levels. That would be uh, too much. 
at least the main uh, minerals calcium and phosphorus we come across them very often in various pathologies bone related pathologies certain key enzymes so at least those you should be familiar with if i were the examiner i wouldn't give you the normal values i mean uh, after looking at those values you should be able to make out whether these are normal or abnormal just like when you give, when we present you with a radiographic image it can be iops opgs occlusal radiograph or chest x ray do you expect us to give a normal radiograph simultaneously you don't expect us to give a normal radiograph right so you should have that normal range in mind always whether it whether it is radiological findings or it can be your lab findings so normal ranges have to be in your mind if not accurate values at least the vague estimates i hope you got my point right so information related to this particular session we'll be sharing it in the form of a reference material and you can go through the same in e classes and as i said if you have any queries you need any further assistance always feel free to get back through mail 24 by 7 wish you all the best love you all good night